Chapter 46. Alina had been here for 49 days now. She had counted the sunsets. A couple of times she'd panicked, sure she'd forgotten the number, but then it had come back to her. Little Luca was almost crawling now, rolling over and smiling at her. He was going to be a big, strong boy. She felt pride swell in her belly. Her period had arrived yesterday. When the monster saw the blood he hit her, punching her again when she laughed and mocked him, told him she would rather die than bear his child. She watched Luca playing with the wooden rattle the monster had left in the cot and wondered what Ion was doing right now. What had he done after he got off the train? Was he waiting for her to call him? Had he worried when she didn't get in touch? Did he care? She knew he wouldn't have reported her absence to the police because of the cocaine. He would be too scared of questions. But what about the plan? What did the English couple do next? Did they carry the drugs unwittingly to England? Did Camellia rob them as planned? She could picture Camellia and Ion now, having decided to split the proceeds in two, pleased that she had vanished. When the monster raped her she conjured up pictures of her former boyfriend and the hate consumed her, created a force field that protected her from the reality of what was happening. It had been his stupid fucking idea, his fucking stupid fault. She lay in her bed and imagined hurting him, a red rage enveloping her, and her fantasies flickered between smashing the monster's face with a brick and smashing Ion's face, until the two became interchangeable. When the monster hit her, it was as if Ion had hit her. When the monster parted her legs, she remembered how Ion had done the same, and she regretted every second she had given to him. And what about Daniel and Laura? At first, she had been convinced they would seek help, go to the police. They had come here to look for her, had escaped, thanks to her, and she was sure they would send people to rescue her. That night, the monster had shot the two women in this room, replacing them with her. She had watched as he dragged the bodies from the room. On her first full day here, chained to the bed, trying to be brave, to be defiant, she had heard voices downstairs, and was convinced the police must be here, asking questions. She screamed until her throat felt like it was bleeding. But no one came, not for hours, and then it was just him, the monster, and that was the first time he'd beaten her, little Luca watching from between the bars of his cot. That night, she had woken and sensed someone standing over her. Two people, she was sure. But she felt too groggy from the beating to focus, and she soon slipped back into unconsciousness. For days after that, she waited, but still no one came. And with every day that passed, her hatred of the English couple grew. The light between the window boards told her the sun had been up for a couple of hours but the monster hadn't come to see her yet. Luca was crying, hungry, reaching out for her from his cot. Her chest ached, seeing him like that, but at the same time she allowed hope to flare. Maybe the monster had gone away, or was dead. Okay, so her ankles were chained to this bed, but if she had enough time she was sure she could free herself. But then the door opened and, as always, she braced herself. Would he discover that her period had started? Beside her, Luca whimpered as someone came into the room and switched the light on. It wasn't the monster. This man was older, with a bald head. Despite his age he looked fit, with broad shoulders and a body with more muscle than fat. She recognized him but her head was so muddled she couldn't remember where from. She began babbling immediately. You have to help me, I'm being kept prisoner here, a man kidnapped me. Are you the police? Oh God, please God, have you come to save me? He ignored her, walking over to the cot and lifting the baby, stroking his head and making little noises to comfort him. Luca was a good boy and he soon fell quiet. The man turned him this way and that, inspecting him. Finally, he nodded and put him back in the cot, handed him a bottle of milk and watched as the baby lay drinking it. He turned to her. He appeared to be amused. Where did she know him from? She thought she had it but the knowledge slipped away. He sat down on the edge of the bed and stroked her face. He spoke to her in their native language. You've done a good job, looking after the little baby. Well done. He patted her hand. Luca, she whispered. You gave him a name. He smiled. 
I like it. But. He'll have a new one soon. She blinked at him. She was so weak, hungry, sucked dry of life and energy. She was filthy and needed a hot bath and tampons and clean clothes. Tears crawled through the dirt on her cheeks. Are you here to save me? She asked. He stroked her face again, brushing away a teardrop then squinting disapprovingly at the gray smudge on his thumb. I'm afraid not, he said. Not you. Not now. I'm here to take little Luca. She jerked upwards, trying to push herself up onto her elbows. No. The man shushed her. Don't worry about him. He laid a hand on her bare belly. His palm was ice cold. Soon, if all goes well, you'll have a baby of your own to look after. He stood up, the mattress creaking, and walked back over to the cot, bent to lift Luca, who had drained the bottle, foamy milk streaking the plastic. The man walked towards the door. Alina cried out. Please, no, don't take him. He's mine. He's my baby. Luca. The man stopped, tipping his head to examine her tear-streaked face. The way he looked at her reminded Alina of a farmer appraising livestock. For a single wonderful moment she thought he would change his mind, let her keep the baby. Instead, he lifted Luca's little chubby arm and made the baby wave. Bye-bye, mama, the old man said in a shrill voice. As Alina sobbed, the old man laughed and carried the baby out of the room. She heard his heavy footsteps thumping down the steps. Several days passed. She couldn't sleep without the soft, snuffling sounds the baby made. She cried as if she was his real mother. When she wasn't thinking about Luca she tried to remember where she'd seen the old man who'd taken the baby away, but the inside of her head was so cloudy that every time she thought she had the answer it slipped away. Shortly after dawn on the third morning without Luca, she heard a knocking sound from below. Somebody was at the front door. She wanted to cry out but was afraid of incurring the monster's wrath. She stayed silent and could make out men's voices coming from below. Three of them, she was sure. That made sense, the monster, the old man and the newcomer. They talked for a while, and then she heard footfalls on the stairs. At least two people coming up. She braced herself, pulling the wretched blanket over her body. The old man came in first, switching the light on, followed by a fat man in a policeman's uniform. For a moment, hope surged inside her. She's pretty, the fat policeman said. He stepped closer to the bed. He had large hands and broken veins on his nose. A drunk. Alina's father used to have veins like that. Isn't she? Said the old man. One of the best we've had. He pulled the blanket off her. Alina, take off your gown. She shook her head. Do it, he snapped, raising a fist. The policeman watched, wearing an inscrutable expression. Arms shaking, she pulled the gown up over her head, exposing her knockied body. It was freezing in the room and she hugged herself, shivering. You want to go with her? Asked the old man. No. It's okay. A little early in the day for me. The policeman chuckled. These days, I mainly like to look. Too fat and weak to get it up, Alina thought. The old man nodded in an understanding way. Well, now that you've seen, we can go downstairs where it's warm. Oh, must we? The policeman said, his dead eyes still touring Alina's body. We can chat here, yes. The old man laughed and waved a hand. Oh, yes. You're not going to tell anyone, or you, Alina. He laughed again. Take your arms away from your chest, girl. Show us what you've got. That's it. The policeman made a low sound as though suckling the breasts. His eyes were feasting upon. The old man went to the door and bellowed down the stairs. Drajos. Bring us a bottle of vodka and two glasses. Not too early for that, I trust, Constantine. Oh, no. Never too early. The monster appeared, so his name was Drajos, with the drink and glasses, like a butler in a black and white horror movie. He fetched two chairs too and, after Drajos had left the room, the two other men sat down, adjusting their chairs to maintain a good view of her, and opened the bottle. How's business? Constantine asked without moving his eyes from her. Good God, was he going to jerk off right here and now? 
Oh, not bad. Just did an excellent deal. But I could do with some fresh stock. I'll let you know if anyone suitable crosses my path, said Constantine. Yes. The demand for high quality product is stronger than ever. Especially. Among Russians. But right now, you only have this one sow. The old man nodded and Alina blinked. The policeman really had used the word for a female pig. She fought back the urge to spit at him. If she could free herself from these manacles, get her hands on a weapon. She zoned out, entertaining herself with bloody visions of what she could do to him with a sharpened stick and a small knife. I like to look. She'd pluck out his fucking eyes. No need to cut off his limp dick. So, tell me what's happening in town, the old man said. That's what you came here to talk to me about, yes. Constantine nodded towards Alina. A young man has been going around Breva, looking for this one, asking questions. Really? What does he look like? Him. Jim Body, about five foot seven or eight, in his twenties. Ion. Oh God, he was looking for her. He hadn't given up. She tried to keep her face neutral but the old man was grinning at her. That sounds like her boyfriend, from the train. How sweet. He's come to try to find her. Too. Save her. The policeman glanced at Alina, who was still trying to keep her face from betraying her emotions. She didn't feel completely alone anymore. Ion actually cared about her. In an instant she felt stronger. But don't worry. I have dealt with the situation. I have sent him off. Searching for oranges. Alina swallowed. This was an expression often used by the older generation, dating from the time when the fruit was impossible to find in the country's shops. Good, said the old man. What about? An English couple. Any British visitors to Breva? The old man stooped to pick up the vodka bottle as he said this, so he didn't see the look that crossed Constantin's face as he said, no. Why do you ask? Sitting upright again now, refreshing his glass, the old man replied, Oh, just something I heard about. Constantine shook his head and smiled. We don't get many visitors from England in Breva. Some steam train enthusiasts a while back, maybe one or two visitors to the Gold Museum. Oh, and a guy who was obsessed with werewolves. Okay. Well, that's good. After the men left, drunk and slapping each other on the back Constantine casting a final greedy but impotent look at her body, Alina pulled the dirty gown over her head and stretched out her arm for the blanket. She couldn't reach it. She wrapped her arms around herself, shivering. Why had the policeman lied about Daniel and Laura? She had seen his expression. He had definitely encountered them. Had they tried to report what they'd seen? She could imagine them talking to Constantine, him promising to look into it, the naive Brits trusting this corrupt policeman. Perhaps they thought they had done enough. She clenched her fists, digging her nails into her palms. Pathetic. Because she was still here. They were home, safe and well. And she had no doubt she was going to die here, the sow, slaughtered in an abattoir. Chapter 47 Ion sat on his bed back at home in Sibiu. The first thing he'd done when he returned, exhausted and dispirited, was call for his cat outside. But after two months, the creature had no doubt found someone else to feed it. After meeting the helpful policeman, Constantine, he had gone to Bucharest to look for Alina. According to the cop, Alina had been in Breva shortly after the incident on the train. The cop, who seemed much nicer than the bastards back home, went and spoke to the guy in the ticket office at the station who remembered selling a ticket to Bucharest to a girl matching Alina's description. So Ion had gone to Bucharest. By this point, seven weeks had passed. Progress in the city was slow. He trudged around bars and seedy nightclubs, showing Alina's photograph to club goers and doormen. A week in, a heroin addict Ion met in a hostel said he was sure he had seen this girl dealing drugs, he wasn't sure what exactly, at a club called Sapphire in a district called Drister. Ion wasted another week hanging out at this sleazy place, but there was no sign of her, and no one else had seen her. Ion realized the heroin addict had been lying. Then something really shitty happened. 
He attracted the attention of a group of local gangsters, who wanted to know what he was doing, if he was trying to muscle in on their turf. They beat him up, put him in hospital for two weeks. As soon as he felt better, when he no longer needed painkillers every four hours, he came home. Shattered and sick of the fruitless search, he spent the last of his money on a bag of industrial strength skunk and holed up with his Xbox. He could have stayed like that until hunger forced him out to find a job, to get on with life. And then Camellia had called him. So, she said. Did you find her? He groaned into the phone. No. She's vanished from the face of the earth. A policeman in Breva. Where? It's this shithole in Transylvania. He told me that he'd seen her, that she went to Bucharest. But I might as well have been searching for a virgin on, he named the housing estate where he and Camellia had grown up. Fuck. She sighed, then switched into a tone of voice he knew well. The sweet, seductive Camellia. Can I ask you a favor? Can you lend me some money? He roared with laughter. I'm skint, Camellia. I have no money. An eviction notice came yesterday. I'm going to have to get a job. Luckily I know a lot of dealers but. Dot single quote. She cut him off. I've got some money issues myself, she said. You know I owe a lot of money to the guys who helped get me over here. I've been paying them off by working at the club. Now they're saying they want their money back faster. They want me to go on the game. Right. To become a prostitute, Ion. That's. Bad. Fuck you, she spat. She sounded like she was on the verge of tears. He waited while she gathered herself. So. Have you found any evidence that Alina sold the stuff? Or that she's been trying to sell it? No. None. Shit. Maybe I was wrong. Perhaps the English couple. Did bring it back here after all. But you said. Dot single quote. Yes, she snapped. I know what I said. I thought that was the most likely explanation. Hello, are you still there? Yes. I'm just wondering. If Alina didn't take the stuff, what's happened to her? Where is she? I don't fucking know. But I bet our English friends do. I thought you'd be able to find Alina, that she'd leave a trail like some kind of punk slug. But now. The Brits are all we have. Our last chance of getting that money. Do you agree? Ion nodded. Well. Sorry, I was nodding yes. She made an exasperated sound. I'm desperate, Ion. If I can't get my hands on some cash quickly I'm going to have to run. Now she began to cry, a sound Ion couldn't bear. I don't know what I'm going to do. Come on, calm down. You've got the keys to their place, haven't you? Send them to me. When they're out, I'll go in, take a look around. Even if I don't find the stuff they must have loads of things I could sell. The guy looks like the type who'd have a top of the range computer. She's probably got jewelry. There might be cash lying around. Please, Ion. He agreed to call her back then looked around the room, at the filthy carpet, the crappy furniture, the eviction notice lying face down on the side table. He thought about how he was going to have to start selling drugs for some jerk who would treat him like a slave. But could he scrape together the fare to England? Maybe if he went by train. It would take a lot longer, but if he sold his Xbox, the remainder of the weed, went to visit his aunt and helped himself to some of her jewelry. He cursed the idea that he'd wasted the past three months. But Camellia was right. The Brits must know something. He went online and searched English news reports. There was nothing about a British pair returning from Europe and handing in a haul of cocaine, and he was sure that would have made the news. He knew they hadn't been arrested at customs. That meant there was still a chance they had the cocaine or, if they'd sold it, the money. It was better than sitting around here doing nothing. And at the end of it there was a chance he'd be rich. He'd always wanted to see England too. Hold off, he said, when he called Camellia. I'm coming over. Your knight in shining armor. Chapter 48. Today was the day she was going to do it. Put an end to it. She. Giggled at the thought of his face when he came into the room and found her lying in a puddle of her own blood. What would he do? Would he cry? 
The notion made her giggle again, the laughter bubbling through her like water surging through an unblocked pipe. For months, laughter had seemed like something she would never experience again, like beer and pizza and soft sheets and shopping and bus rides and hair dye and friends and beaches and TV and books and music and cuddles and happiness. But now, now she'd started, she couldn't stop. Blood, blood, glorious blood, she sang to herself, changing the words to an English song she'd heard when she was a little girl, and she stroked the veins on her wrists and wondered it if would hurt and whether she'd care. And as suddenly as it started, the giggling stopped. She had lost count of how long she'd been here. After the old man came and took Luca away, little Luca, she couldn't remember what he smelled like anymore, could barely recall what he looked like, she'd stopped counting sunsets. All the days, the long short days, blurred and warped and ran together like a painting in the rain. All she knew was that it had got colder and colder in the room, that even with all the blankets wrapped around her she still shivered. She was sure Christmas had come and gone. It was a new year now. She spent every day lying on the bed, fantasizing about revenge. The cop, Constantine, she would push him from a great height onto spiked railings, they would pierce his arsehole, disembowel him while she shook with laughter. Laura and Daniel, for their pathetic attempts to save her, she would make him watch while she slit Laura's throat and bathed in her blood, and then she would cut off his cock and make him eat it before hammering a nine-inch nail into his puny chest. The old man, whom she hadn't seen for ages, he had a very special punishment awaiting him. She whiled away the hours daydreaming about sulfuric acid and knives and vinegar and ropes and hammers and pliers. Sometimes, she became aware that she was speaking her fantasies aloud, and that the monster was listening, excited by what he heard, pulling off his clothes. Those were the worst times. The monster climbed into her bed every two or three days, more frequently in the middle of the month. While he did his thing, it never took very long, she imagined them in hell together. But he would be a condemned soul and she would be a fallen angel, one of Satan's army, and they would spend an eternity of torture and suffering together. Every day she hoped he would kill her so she could go to hell and wait for him. Sometimes when he was on top of her, she would look over his shoulder and watch a crack appear in the center of the dim room, a tear in the fabric of the world, throbbing at the edges, and she would imagine herself stepping through it, escaping this world. In these visions, she didn't go to hell but back to her old life, the city, and she would run through the streets, dodging traffic, laughing, dazzled by the lights and drunk on lovely exhaust fumes. The monster couldn't follow her there. Sometimes the crack appeared when he wasn't around, during her daily 45 minutes of freedom, but when she stepped towards it, it would seal, like it had been zipped shut, and vanish. Her period had come again this morning. Drajos hadn't seen it yet. He came into her room, as always, at first light, with her breakfast on a tray. Water and porridge. He unfastened the clamps that held her ankles in place and left the room, allowing her 45 minutes to exercise and wash. She knew he would inspect her when he came back, to see if she was pregnant. The blood disgusted him. She, as a woman, disgusted him. She could see it on his face. That must be why he never stayed to watch her when she washed or used the toilet, lucky, because her bladder would have exploded by now. For a while after Luca was taken she had thought that maybe she could make him like her, feel some affection for her. Maybe she could persuade him to let her go. But when she talked to him it was as if she was speaking a foreign language, he didn't react. She kept trying, telling him about herself, her family, trying to make herself more human, to create a bond. Until one morning as she was speaking he punched her in the mouth and split her lip. She didn't talk to him again after that. She hadn't spoken for weeks. Alina washed and used the toilet in the corner of the room. How long did she have left before he came back and chained her up again? Not long. She needed to act now. She started giggling again when she pictured him finding her, but forced herself to stop. Blood, blood, glorious blood looped in her head and the crack hovered in the center of the room, luring her with its fake promise. She ignored it. There was only one way out of here. She crossed to the window and listened. The forest was still, the birds silent. 
The house was silent too. Usually around now she would hear a toilet flush somewhere in the house. The monster taking his morning dump. The window was covered by three rough, vertical boards, each one nailed to the window frame at each corner. A sloppy job. The nails hadn't been driven all the way in. For weeks now, during this 45-minute period, Alina had been working on the middle board, alternately tugging at its edges and gripping the heads of the nails securing it and pulling on them, ignoring the pain in her fingertips. For days, none of the nails had shifted at all. But, like the sea eroding a pebble, she worked at it repeatedly until, one morning, the first nail moved a fraction. Encouraged, she redoubled her efforts until another budged, and then another, and then the last. She had to go slowly, working at loosening each nail's hole so that it could not only be pulled out but pressed back into place with her aching thumb so the monster wouldn't notice anything. With all of the nails loosened, her leverage on the board increased, and increased yet again when she could get her fingers behind it and properly work at it. And then, yesterday morning, the board and all its nails came free in her bloodied hands. She had kissed it, a tear rolling down her cheek. Now, it was time. She pulled the nails out and tugged the board away from the window. Just as it had when she had first glimpsed it yesterday, the beauty of the scene beyond brought tears to her eyes. The snowing trees, the clouds, the sky. She had thought she would never see the world again. It hurt her eyes and a line from a poem came to her tumbling out of her subconscious. Beauty is nothing but the beginning of terror. She stood transfixed for a moment then heard a toilet flush in the bowels of the house and was startled into action. She went to the bed and pulled the filthy sheet from the mattress. It was easy to tear a strip off, she wrapped it around her hand and went back to the condensation street window. She raised her fist and punched the glass between the remaining boards as hard as possible. The window shook but didn't shatter. Taking a deep breath, she tried again. This time the window broke, a crack snaking across its middle. Panting slightly, Alina pressed against the glass, both hands wrapped in the sheet now, until a section fell away, bouncing down the outside of the house. She caught her breath, certain he would hear, that he would come running and stop her. But the house was silent. With her fingers still inside the sheet, Alina tugged at the broken glass, pulling away a perfect shard. With a final glance towards the door, and the empty cot, she counted to three, determined to do it before she lost courage. She couldn't stay here any longer, not one more single day, and she closed her eyes as she sliced the glass across her arm and watched the blood as it flowed from her and dripped on the floor, watched it like it was somebody else's arm, somebody else's vein. She crumpled to the ground. Chapter 49 she was still breathing when Drajos entered the room. A click as the door opened, a long pause during which she imagined him taking in the scene, her motionless body lying half-concealed. Beneath the dirty sheet, the hole in the window behind her exposing the snow-capped trees beyond, her arm outstretched, the blood pumping from her slashed veins, pooling across the floorboards towards the empty cot. She hoped, as her lifeblood left her, as her exit drew closer, that he would cry out, give her the satisfaction of hearing his pain when he realized how stupid he'd been, leaving her here unchained, trusting that her fear would keep her from doing anything stupid. But there was no cry, no sound of pain. Instead, after the pause, the only sound was that of his footsteps coming closer as he rushed across the room pausing to stare down at her before stooping to take her slashed wrist in both hands, a moment of hesitation before he reached for the sheet, pulling it away to expose her other arm, the hand in which she held the shard of glass. With a scream that made birds rise from the trees outside, with all the hatred and fury that boiled in her veins, Alina drove the jagged spike of glass into his neck. Drajos collapsed onto his side, making a terrible choking sound that seemed to come not through his mouth but through this new hole. His arms spasmed as he tried to grab at the glass, to pull it out, but there was too much blood, the slippery liquid making it impossible for him to get a grip. Alina jumped to her feet as he thrashed about, the blood pumping from his body ten times faster than it had from hers. The cuts on her arms were superficial, she had taken care not to slice the major artery in her arm. 
She snatched up the sheet now and tore off another thick strip, wrapping it tightly around her forearm to stem any more blood flow. Her arm stung but this pain was nothing, nothing. As she tied the sheet she looked down at the monster, his legs kicking out as he tried to get onto his knees, slipping on his own blood and landing on his belly. She ran to the open door and hurried barefoot down the stairs until she reached the hall in which the English couple had left her when they deserted her, abandoning her to her fate. She ran over to the front door, pulled it open. A blast of icy air hit her. She gazed down at herself. She was wearing only a grimy, blood-stained cotton gown. If she went outside like this she would die of exposure. She looked around, and heard a thump from upstairs, a roar of pain. The monster was still alive. She needed to hurry. A cry stuck in her throat. Why hadn't she finished him off? She froze for a moment. Clothes. She needed clothes and shoes. Anything would do. She didn't want to go back up the stairs. Forcing herself to stay calm, she remembered the room where the monster had taken her that first night before Daniel and Laura arrived. A door led off from the corner of the hallway and she ran over to it, her shadow bouncing behind her. The door was unlocked and led, as she remembered dimly, through the fog of the last three months, to a short stairway down to another room. She ran down these steps now, stumbling and jarring her ankle. She swore, then laughed, then saw again before entering the room. It was dim and smelled of bad breath and rank meat. There were a dozen heavy crates stacked up along one wall. She lifted the lid of the top crate and was shocked to see her own clothes inside. Her jeans, t-shirt, leather jacket. Her underwear. Her boots were there too, the ones she'd left in the forest and on his front path Daniel had carried one into the house with them, and the other the monster had wrenched off when she tried to kick him as he dragged her towards the house. She took off the disgusting gown and got dressed. It felt strange, unreal, to wear proper clothes again after so long. The bra felt too big, the jeans loose on her hips. She wondered if there was a mirror nearby, but dreaded seeing her own reflection. I bet I look like a dead woman, she thought, and something about this made something in her brain pop, and she grinned. She checked the back pocket of her jeans. Her passport was still there. She remembered that on the train, the border guards had come through and checked it, she'd slipped it into her pocket instead of putting it in her bag. This was all going better than expected. She heard a bang from above. The front door. Had she left it open? She looked around the room, opening more of the crates, searching for a weapon. In one crate she found a pile of paperwork. It looked like a list of transactions. She took a few sheets, folded them and shoved them into her pocket. In the other crate she found women's clothes, twelve sets. In the cold room she suddenly became aware of their spirits, a dozen dead, and heard them whispering to her. For us. She took the lid from another one of the crates. It was stout, made of three strips of wood running lengthways with a single, shorter strip holding them together. Dropping it to the floor, she put her boot across two of the strips and pulled at the third, the dead women urging her on. She grunted, felt blood ooze from her cut wrist, but the strip of wood broke free. She hefted it, and headed towards the stairs. 